The vase scan team has scanned a number of supposedly ancient stone vases. Some of them look quite precise, with roundness within a few thousandths of an inch. Their target audience claims that such precision can't be achieved even with the most advanced modern tools. We bring together six different hard stone vessels in a bare knuckles precision showdown. Which one will win? In this video, we present a total of six hard stone vessels, with their roundness precision shown as color maps. The scans were done with a Carl Zeiss Comet scanner, which can go as low as 16 microns in resolution. To avoid repeating the vase scan team, we'll shorten it to just VST. Let's begin. The first vessel isn't a contestant, and we'll soon explain why. It's here just for reference. It was advertised as made of basalt but you can scratch the surface with steel. It's most likely some softer stone, just dyed to look like basalt. Because it's not really a hard stone, it can't be in the precision contest. But we decided to show it, as it has some relevant features, and it's a good reference for a handmade vessel done by eye. We were given a list of the tools used in its fabrication, and we confirmed that a lathe was not involved. Inside, the vase has heavy concentric grooves, They must have been made by either this borer, or one of the tools visible here, with or without a slurry. The undercut is at a right angle to the central axis. It means that hollowing out at a right angle through a narrow opening is not an issue. Here's the scan data, with steps in the color map set to one-tenth of an inch. Note that these steps will change for other vessels, as accuracy increases. As far as roundness, the total distance between the high and low spots is about one-tenth of an inch or about 2.5 millimeters. A quick technical note. In statistics, words like variance or standard deviation have very specific meanings. Here we use more generic terms. Let's say the green line is the ideal geometric shape and the white line the actual surface. By deviation, in blue, we mean how much the surface diverges from the ideal in one direction, plus or minus. By peak to trough, in yellow, we mean the gap between maximum deviations in two opposite directions. Let's return to the handmade vessel. So the range of deviation from an ideal circle is about half of that, plus or minus. This range is actually quite decent for a completely eyeballed shape, no lathe, and a vessel that's a mass market souvenir, not a showpiece. At this precision scale, the scratched ornaments are barely visible. In case you wonder how deep these scratched marks are, here's a close-up of a cross-section. It's a bit more than the thickness of a sheet of paper, about twice the width of a human hair. As an aside, this jar was sent from Egypt and everything in the box was checked by customs. It seems like Egyptian Post opens up packages that look like they may contain antiques. Let's start the actual contest with the random Chinese funerary urn we've already shown in the past. Here it is, with steps in the color map now set to one thousandth of an inch. The deviation on this urn, made by a random Chinese workshop, is within a few thousands of an inch. We don't know for sure how this specific urn was made. Chinese workshops crank out such urns by the thousands, so it has to be a mostly automated process. Most likely the stone is turned and worked with one or more abrasive wheels, in shallow cuts, following a programmed contour. Polishing can be automated, manual, or a combination. Assuming this method was used on this urn, it leaves different patterns than those on some of the vessels scanned by VST. On the belly of the urn, the regions of slight deviations form large patches with soft edges. On some of the VST vessels, there's distinct horizontal banding. But other vessels scanned by VST don't have such strong banding. Such differences in patterns may offer clues to specific fabrication or polishing techniques. All may involve rotary motion, but with different tools doing the abrasion. Returning to the Chinese urn, we can make a few more observations. The discrepancies are much stronger near these sharp corners. Possibly, as the abrasive wheel cuts in along an existing plane, 
it's subject to slight pressure from that side. The patterns of overcuts and undercuts, blue and red, tend to alternate at roughly equal angles around the vessel's perimeter. Possibly, it stems from a tiny vibration that develops on the mount of the abrasive wheel, as it's not perfectly rigid. Keep in mind that we're talking about a few thousands of an inch, of no concern to normal buyers. Next is another random Chinese granite urn, probably from a different workshop. The scan results are similar to the first Chinese vase, maybe a bit better. The deviation is still a few thousands of an inch, but the patches on the belly are smaller in size. These two urns show that circularity within a few thousands of an inch is pretty normal for granite vessels mass-produced today in China. This is in stark contrast to the claims of the vase scan team that this level of accuracy on a granite vessel is either impossible to achieve today or it would be very, very expensive. Their exact claim varies depending on what day of the week it is. On vases that you had had analyzed to super high precision levels that really showed that there's no way we could have made these granite vases in this day and age today, and yet they all came out of Egypt. So, indeed, uh, indeed, yeah. Their aerospace levels of precision in terms of, you know, a couple thousandths of an inch uh, standard deviation for concentricity around us, that type of thing. We can do it, as Chris Dunn would say. However, it would be tremendously expensive. Somehow, Chinese workshops crank out granite urns with aerospace level precision by the thousands. And you can even get one for under 80 bucks. Next up, a small agate jar, made in Pakistan in the 1970s, bought as a souvenir. Agate is as hard as granite. There's no info about how it was made. The ring-shaped mark on the bottom is very regular, with sharp narrow borders, most likely left by a mounted mechanical tube drill. This suggests a process similar to this one. On the interior sides of the agate jar are ridges left by an unknown tool. If you're hollowing out soft stone, you can just use a sharp steel point. For hard stone like agate or granite, you'll probably need particle abrasion, either fixed or loose. By the way, you actually can turn hard stone with sharp points if you don't care much about safety. It's just that it's bad for your lathe. The sound is horrible. This bolt is coming loose and at any moment, chunks of granite can start flying through the air. Let's return to the small agate jar. Its scan results are very good. We see small patches, all within a few thousandths of an inch. Remember, this jar was made in Pakistan in 1970s, a time when VST says tools were too primitive to achieve such precision in hard stone. We've already seen two of the next three vessels in a previous video. The maker, Bison Hill Stonecrafts, agreed to have these vessels scanned. They'll be a good reference for hard stone vessels turned on a lathe using handheld tools. If you're interested, Bison Hill also does experiments with casting molten stone. It's not nearly as easy as the proponents suggest, but this is beside the scope of this video. First up is the granite cup we've seen before. Interestingly, this is not a chip that happened during fabrication. It's actually a remnant of the original weathered exterior, by the way, this stone has a strange response to light. These pictures have not been color corrected, nor was the stone stained. Yet somehow it can look greenish, brownish, or bluish. Here's the scan data. As with the Chinese vases in the agate jar, the roundness is within a few thousandths of an inch. This midsection is very good, under one thousandth. Compared to automated lathes, some of the patches have more distinct marks within them, perhaps because the abrasive tool was handheld. This was the first hard stone vessel turned on a lathe by Bison Hill Stonecrafts, so the next two should only be better. Next up is a granite shot glass. You can shine a light through its crystals, just like on one of the scanned vases. There's no magic to it, just a craftsman skilled enough to create thin walls. Amazingly, virtually the whole surface is under one thousandths of an inch in roundness precision. This was done in granite, on a regular lathe, as best as we could determine from the vase scan reports, every vessel scanned so far has large patches where the variance in roundness is greater than two thousandths of an inch. This granite shot glass has no big patches exceeding two thousandths of an inch in variance. 
this granite shot glass throws all notions of ancient computer-controlled five-axis CNC mills through the window. Next is an obsidian shot glass. We've seen it's being made before. If you shine a light through its walls, it looks like dark glass. You see the vein structure in the material. Some spots may look like chips, but this is just the internal structure reacting to light. The scan results are downright stunning. The surface is so uniform, it's hard to even tell that the object is rotating. To see the rotation, we have to drop the scale to ten thousandths of an inch. Basically, the whole surface is under five ten thousandths of an inch in roundness precision. On hard stone vessels turned on a lathe, we tend to see irregular patches with soft edges. On some of the vessels scanned by VST, we see horizontal bands with more distinct borders. These bands generally wrap around the whole circumference. These marks may hint at a different abrasive technique. For example, someone pushing a small abrasive surface against the vessel, as opposed to the abrasive tool being mounted on an independent base. If verified and categorized, such differences could be diagnostic of the abrasion method used for a particular vase. Sadly, VST hasn't made any statistical analysis for vases they've already scanned. We're not given answers to very basic research questions, like these. Hollowing out an undercut at a right angle to the axis is not a problem, as VST seems to think. Apparently, it can be done with simple manual tools. Believers in ancient high-tech never fail to mention mineral boundaries in granite as supposedly a big technical problem. They're not homogeneous materials, you know, you go from crystal inclusions and, and... Yeah, your feldspar to quartz to mica, hornblende, varying in hardness. It's truly miraculous how Chinese workshops can churn out tens of thousands of granite vases each year without the mineral boundaries being a problem for them. Let's explain why it's not. Here's a cross-section diagram of a granite surface being abraded. Hard minerals are in red, soft minerals in green, in-between minerals in gray. It seems like believers in ancient high-tech always imagine some single sharp point digging into granite and carving out a groove into the surface. It's not how things work. Virtually all hard stone vessels ever made were shaped by abrasive particles, loose or fixed, driven quickly across the surface. At all times, the harder minerals, in red, and the biggest particles, keep the pressing surface away at a small distance. This distance keeps the damage to softer minerals in check. Why? Because the pressing surface can only get as close as the still undamaged hard minerals allow it to. As much as the pressing surface quote-unquote wants to damage the softer minerals, it can't, because the harder minerals stop it. The end result is that all minerals abrade at roughly the same rate. Supposedly, roundness precision within a few thousandths of an inch in hard stone is nearly impossible, very expensive, etc. And I think he's also shown that it would be incredibly difficult to even attempt making something like this today. Not even sure we could do it to the level of precision that's shown in this vase today. It, it may surpass even our capabilities to make in granite. False. All six hard stone vessels in this video, made on a lathe, were just as precise, or better. This includes two completely random Chinese mass market urns and a Pakistani souvenir jar. If anything, as of right now, this level of precision actually seems rather typical for a hard stone vessel properly turned on a regular, properly set up lathe. There's no need at all for five axis CNC mills or special bearings. For those mystified by precise roundness, here's an interesting fact. Amazingly, circles can be created with no ball bearings, no axis, and no center point. Yes, that's right, not even a center point. This is the natural phenomenon called an ice circle. On rare occasions, these circles form in cold, slow-moving water. Over time, as an ice flow slowly rotates, its uneven edges are shaved off, and it turns into a circle. We decided to analyze this top-down view. In extreme close-up, we trace the contour of the ice circle. The drone wasn't perfectly centered, so the circle may have a very slight elliptical distortion. 
Still, as calculated, the maximum deviation from roundness is only 0.72% of the diameter. On a vessel that's 4 inches or 10 centimeters wide, this corresponds to about 3 hundredths of an inch or 0.72 millimeter. Recall that we measured an eyeballed vessel, handmade, not on a lathe. The max deviation was about 5 hundredths of an inch or 1.3 millimeter. In this case, Mother Nature made a circle twice as precise as one eyeballed by a human, though not as good as one turned on a lathe. There are no ball bearings here, no axis, no intellect controlling the process, nobody measures or verifies anything, nobody tries to meet any tolerances. Yet the result is a circle better than one made by human eye. According to the audience attracted to ancient high-tech claims, Roundness precision within a few thousandths of an inch in hard stone vessels is impossible with modern tools. Yet oddly, every single hard stone vessel we scanned, made on regular lathes, is just as precise. The most precise vessel of all we've scanned, an obsidian shot glass, bested the VST vases by roughly an order of magnitude. It was made on a lathe with an abrasive wheel and a dremel. What lathe was it, you ask? A NASA-level lathe? with ultra-precise bearings? No, it was a harbor freight lathe, which usually sells for under 1,000. Among the ancient high-tech crowd, the detachment from reality continues to this day. If you're considering joining this crowd, please read what they write. Because by joining them, you effectively acknowledge that your critical thinking skills are on par with theirs.